have to tell you something. Last weekend, I was not here. Chris Molnar was here and did an awesome job. Was his message not amazing? I mean, he fed my soul last week. Wasn't Chris awesome last week? I mean, I appreciate him so much. You know, but last week, you know where I was? I was with a whole busload of teeny boppers for my son's high school choir trip to New York City. I hope you're praying for me because I needed it. It took me about four days to finally recoup. But you know, last Saturday, we were on the tour bus going through Manhattan to our next stop, fighting through the traffic, when I looked to my right outside the window and I saw the classic New York City scene. I mean, if you've been to New York City, you know how crazy the traffic is and everybody just does their own thing. Well, here we are. I turn to my right. I look outside and right there, there's this car that's double parked. These two guys are in the back loading up their car from whatever they have in the storefront right there. They're putting boxes in. And right in front of the car, they had no idea there was this police officer riding them a ticket. And so here I'm watching. I'm like saying, are these guys even going to notice? Like they're getting a ticket and they don't even see it. And they're just kind of going on with their thing, you know, trying to load their boxes because they don't care what's going on around them. And in front, I see the police officer. He didn't want them to see. I could see him. He kept looking. He was like hurrying, like he didn't want to deal with them either. He puts it in there, and the police officer literally did this. He walked, they're behind the car. He walked around the other cars that are parked on the street, and he's just watching them, like making sure they don't see him. So as he hurried up down the street. And I can just imagine the police officer like, I got him, I got him. I mean, classic New York City. But you know what so often happens is there is these guys were just loading the back of their truck. They're in their own moment, their own bubble, of their own reality, and they have no idea the conflict that's right in front of them, the conflict that they're about to deal with. And isn't that life? Isn't that life? There's conflict all around us. And in so many cases, we don't even know the conflict that we're about to walk right into because we're just on our own little bubbles. We're caught in our own little moments. You see, being caught in our moments causes us to be so naive sometimes that, and sometimes we live in denial about what our future may hold. We, we create our own realities. You see, our moments that we're defining here are, are, can be things like our jobs or our hobbies or our happy places, that place you go just to escape reality or to create your own reality so you don't have to think about what the future might hold. So you don't have to think about the chaos that's all around you. We all do it. We all kind of create our own moments, and then before you know it, we get caught in this moment, and we think we've recreated our own reality where we can just be happy. But there's a problem with that. We don't realize the police officer is right in front of our car that's writing the ticket, do we? We don't realize the conflict that is just around the corner. And we can hide in our bubbles, we can be caught in our moments. But the chaos is going to catch up with us. It's going to catch up with us. Because here's the problem, is that we connect so much with our moments, what we want our reality to be, what we want our normalcy to be. We connect with that more than we connect with Jesus. That's the problem. And we think peace is found if I live in my bubble of my own moment rather than living in the arms of Jesus. See the difference? That is the struggle that we all live in. Because this causes us, when we live in our own moments, when we try to live life in our own little bubbles, we try to create our own little realities, it causes us to miss it or live in such a denial of what is truly in our future that one day we're going to have to face the reality of what is truth. And what does that mean to me? See, because in our future, there is this man by the name of Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was and is and is to come. And the Bible says just as he came once, he is, he is coming back again. 
And he is king, lord, and savior. And that is all of our future. All of our future is going to be running into the face of that reality of Jesus as king, as lord, and a savior. But here's the thing. What you're choosing to do now, who you're choosing to be in this moment, defines how that encounter will be. And it makes a big difference. Because on the horizon is Jesus. And we live in this world of chaos. But he's coming. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, Paul is saying here, guess what? Whether you believe it or not, one day every person will acknowledge the truth that Jesus is Lord. He is truth. He is the ultimate authority. He is king and savior. One day. But this is the problem we live in. In the chaos that surrounds all of us, we tend to live life either as naive or in denial. If we can just kind of create our own moments, our own little bubbles that we can live in, that we don't have to really think about what's going on in Europe or what's going on in my own backyard or maybe even what's going on in my own house. If I can just kind of create my own little environment, create my own really reality and just make my own little happy place, then I can just kind of go on and life will be okay. You can live in that for a time being. You can live in that self-created happiness for a short time. But let me promise you something. One day, reality will break through that. One day, reality will come flying through and we will have to, be, to deal with it. You know, the more we try to live life in our moments, in our bubbles, the more all we do is compound conflict after conflict after conflict and brokenness after brokenness after brokenness. And you don't make it all go away. You just make it a bigger issue when the bubble breaks. And we're all in this quest for peace. For peace. Why do we live in our own little bubbles? Why do we kind of create our own little moments? Because if you're like me, you're trying to create an environment where at least this is peaceful. At least this seems okay. And we try to escape what's going on all around us. But peace is not found in our moments. Peace is not found in the reality we try to create it to be. And here we are on this day that we know is Palm Sunday, which highlights Jesus' <clears throat> triumphal entry. You know, in his triumphal entry that we see in the Gospels, when he rode on this donkey, on this coal, into Jerusalem, this really highlights a group of three different people. Have you ever realized that? As you read the triumphal entry, we really see Jesus' encounter with three different groups of people and what they meant and how they associated with, this, with Jesus. There were the disciples. They were the ones who were around Jesus celebrating, throwing their cloaks down, waving palm branches. The ones celebrating, hey, here's the Messiah. They were excited. Why? Because they believed that the Messiah had come, the king that they expected him to be, to do what they desired him to do. That's what they thought. Then there was the Pharisees. The Pharisees, all they were wanting to do was silence Jesus. And then there was the rest of the crowd, the rest of the city. You see, the majority of the city were not up on that hill walking in with Jesus. Those were his disciples, the hundreds of people who were following him. The majority of the city were down there doing their own thing, living life, doing their normal activities. And we see Jesus encounter with all three of these groups as he entered into Jerusalem on this final week. And this all started in Luke chapter 19, verse 28, when Jesus began to tell his disciples, the closest disciples, the 12, hey, we're going into Jerusalem. I need a few of you to go ahead of me, and I need you to, to, to kind of get this colt, and this is what you'll see. And he explains to them exactly what they'll see, what to expect, and what will happen. And hidden in this story, right before we get into the triumphal entry, is a powerful 
gem, a powerful truth, a powerful reality of who Jesus is in our life. And here, the disciples came into Jerusalem, got the colt, got everything together. And the Bible says in Luke 19, verse 32, catch this. It says, those who weren't ahead of him found it just as he told them. Wow. I think we so often jump over this verse, but this might be one of the most profound verses in this whole story. Because this is not Jesus saying, hey, go down to 4th and Main. There you'll see like this blue building. And then when you see the blue building, you'll see a stop sign. He's not just like recreating his, what he knows in his mind of what the city has. No, he's saying, listen, when you get there, you'll see a colt. This is what the colt will be doing. It will be tied up this way. These people will come out of here. They will say this to you. And this is how you respond to them. And they found it just exactly as he said. You know what this set tells us? Jesus, what he says, always comes true. Just as he says it. Every time. In a world of so many conflicting voices, so many that say, whoever screams the loudest, that must be true. In a world that's tuned so much out, Here's how you can know for sure if it is of God or if it is not. If it is not 100% accurate or true or comes out that way, guess what? It's probably not God. Probably not God. Because Jesus always comes through just as he says he would. He's always 100%. Because why? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows the end. He knows how your story unfolds. And so going back to the story, Jesus starts coming in. He's riding this donkey. He's riding into into Jerusalem. All the disciples, the hundreds that were there celebrating were laying down their cloaks, their coats, the wave in the palm trees, and they were in celebration mode. It was a party time. They were caught in their moment because they believed that this guy, Jesus, was coming in as king to deliver what they wanted their Messiah to deliver, and that was the end of the Roman rule. That was what they believed. Here we go, freedom time. But they had no idea the conflict that was on the horizon, just days away. You know, this is where we see the different groups of people begin to play out. And here's the disciples are the first group of people. And they were all celebrating and shouting, Luke 19, 38, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God in the highest. Can you just imagine the scene? I mean, think of the greatest parade that you ever were a part of or been to. And there you see everybody just kind of celebrating. And here he comes, the highlight of the whole parade, Jesus himself. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. This verse was actually taken from Psalm chapter uh, 118, verse 26. And this was actually used. They would shout this all the time. It was like the way they welcomed pilgrims into Jerusalem. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was like a welcoming call. But Luke takes it a bit further here. He adds in, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord of the Lord. Because here in this moment, they took a cry that they all knew, a a chant they probably have yelled and proclaimed many times when pilgrims came walking into Jerusalem. But there was a subtle difference in this moment. Because in this moment, they were acknowledging and recognizing this pilgrim, this wanderer, there's something different about him. He is the king. And here he comes. Our king has arrived. This brings us to our second group of people. The disciples were all celebrating their king has come. They had no idea in the moment the the conflict that awaited them. But they were just celebrating because here comes this king and he's going to do exactly what we want him to do. How he's going to kind of deliver how he wants us to deliver. And then in that moment, the Pharisees began to just boil up with anger because they realized, wait, whoa, whoa, hold on. Blessed is the what? The king? Uh Uh-uh. 
And you can just see their anger boiling up and boiling over. And they shout out in verse 39. Some of the Pharisees shouted, said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Because they knew that they, that they were kind of highlighting Jesus is the king. And they said, no, he is not. He said, rebuke them. You know what the Pharisees were trying to tell them? You silence them because he is not the authority. They were trying to silence the truth. That's what they were trying to do. They did not view Jesus as king. They did not view Jesus as Lord. They did not see him as the authority of their lives. And they wanted anybody that would view it that way or shout it that way to just be quiet. They wanted to silence what was truth. You know what the heart of our struggle is? I think they highlight the, the heart of the struggle of mankind. And that is, who is authority? What is truth? From Genesis to Revelation, we see this battle play out. This struggle play out. The heart of mankind's question has always been and always will be, who is authority and what is truth? And here we see the Pharisees highlight that when Jesus was walking into Jerusalem. Uh uh, quiet him. We don't want him around. We don't want his truth here. And we do that today too. You know, what is truth? What is authority? We live in a world full of gods. Whether you realize it or not, we've all created our own personal God. Maybe in the bubbles we've created, our own moments that we've created, we've created our own gods, those things we run to to try to make our place happy in our lives. <clears throat> we all have gods that we worship. Maybe it is our jobs. Maybe it is our hobbies. Maybe it is our happy place. You know, so often we identify those gods, we talked about it a few weeks ago, our I am statements. You know, how do you fill out that I am statement? I am what usually defines who is the God of your life. Our gods we use to try to define who we are. When Jesus says, I want to be the thing that identifies who you are. I am trite. I am truth. And in this way, we have become a world that has convinced ourselves that whatever is true for you is truth. And whatever might be true for you is truth. But there is a fundamental problem with this philosophy. A huge problem with this philosophy. You cannot escape the fact that in a world of multiple truths, that at one point in time, these truths will all collide. Then you have to deal with the question, well, who's the authority? Who's the authority? It's like if you go downtown Pittsburgh and you run into a one-way street and you say, you know what? Both drivers, you can go whichever way you want. Have at it. Guess what? You're going to watch a collision. You can't go both ways. And the same is true with truth. You can say all you want, whatever is true for you is good for is truth. And what's true for me is truth. You can say that all you want, but sooner or later, truths collide. Then you gotta deal with authority. Who is the authority? At some point, we gotta wrestle with that. It all boils down to it, and this is where the Pharisees were. This is where mankind has been from Genesis today. And we can live in our bubbles of our own reality. But truth will shine through. You know how Jesus said it? The Pharisees were saying, Jesus, silence your disciples. And Jesus said, you want to quiet me? You want to quiet the truth? You want to silence it? Let me tell you something. They can be quiet, but check this out. Even the rocks will shout out the truth. Even the rocks. So you can quiet these people, but the truth will always shine through. That's what Jesus told them. You can't silence truth. You can't. 
And we see this, this reality play out all through scriptures. Here, when Jesus said the rocks will cry out what is truth. Paul wrote in Philippians 2 that one day every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That he is the authority of truth. In Romans chapter 1 it says that all creation cries out that there is a God. There is a God and you better praise him. All throughout the Bible we see the reality that people can quiet down but truth will still shine. And at some point, we all have to deal with it. We all have to deal with what is the reality of truth and who is the authority. Because one day, every person will face the reality of truth. The question is, where will you be on that day? Where will you be on that day? You know, the problem that we miss reality of this truth because we tend to either live in denial or we're naive based upon the moments and the bubbles that we try to create for ourselves, our happy places. We create our own reality based on maybe what feels right. And we get caught in our own moments. And before we know, we may be loading the boxes in the back of our car and we don't even know the conflict that's right in front of our car. Steps away. But the conflict is there. So we think if I can just stay in the reality of my bubble, create my own happy place, then everything will be okay. At least that's what we think, but truth always shines through. And as Jesus kind of worked his way through the crowd, disciples celebrating, the Pharisees trying to silence them all, and then Jesus worked his way. And the scene is just unbelievable to me. Because everybody's caught in their own little bubble. And nobody even realizes what Jesus is about to do in this moment. What's happening in this moment. This, they're all kind of back here celebrating. Jesus comes to the end of the crowd, kind of overlooking the city. And check this out, verses 41 and 43, 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he, that's Jesus, wept over it. And he said, if you... Even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Wow. No one, they were all kind of in their moment. And Jesus gets here and he says, you guys, do you not see what's happening? You all think peace is in your little bubbles. And you have no idea what's coming. We live in a world where conflict and hardship and brokenness just continually increases and increases and increases and breaks us down and beats us down. And we're all searching for peace. We're all searching for happiness. We're all trying to build it up and we're trying to create it based upon our lives, on what we feel is right, our own bubbles of reality. But truth be cold, this doesn't escape what is reality. There's conflict on the horizon. And Jesus is overlooking the whole city and he's just weeping crying as he looked over it. And this group of people in the rest of the town, they were just going through their normal routines. They were just living lives. They were in God's temple, and they didn't even notice God. They were caught in the moment of their normal activities. And the verbiage we see here is not just like a little water that went down Jesus' cheek. I mean, Jesus was almost probably in an ugly cry. I mean, have you ever ugly cried? Yeah. Jesus is that broken in that moment. And we see such strong emotion. He says, man, if you guys only knew what would actually bring you peace. But you're all kind of just living your own lives. Doing whatever you think you need to do to make yourself happy. And you're missing it. She said, if you only knew what would bring you peace. If you only knew what would actually bring you peace. Let those words of Jesus echo into your mind as we go into this week. If you only knew what would actually bring you peace. It's not your job. It's not your hobbies. It's not your happy places. It's not however you feel your I am statements in this world. It is Jesus. 
and Jesus alone. And this third group represented all of us. We try to find our happy places, try to find our place, our peace in our own bubbles. And here's the thing. We're all looking for peace. Every one of us. And in the gods that we serve, the religions that we want, the lives that we try to obtain, we try to find peace there, but it's not there. We try to escape reality of all the chaos. Maybe turn off the TV so we don't have to see the news. Or we try to run away from the problems in our own life or to other things. But eventually truth will catch up with us. Jesus is peace. He is the peace. You know, this verse we typically read at Christmas time highlights Jesus coming into the world as peace. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The government, the entire world, says will be on his shoulders. He will take the weight of all the chaos that is in the world. Our hope is not in any of those things. Our peace is not in any of those things. It's Jesus. Through his counsel, through his truth, through his his guidance. Jesus said this in John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He's saying, listen. You're not going to find peace to try to create the world into what you want the world to be. Trying to get the world back to your normal happy place. Or to try to create your own bubble of what you want reality to be. Peace is found in me. And Jesus said, he is the authority. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says his truth is what leads to peace. If he only knew, as he looks over this world, his heart is just breaking. If he only knew that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, not our government, not our jobs, not any life you try to create, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Let me ask you something. What are you trying to find your peace in? What world are you trying to create to just be in your happy place? Because that happiness will eventually get crumbled. What are you trying to find your peace in? My friends, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And peace is found on the, under, under the umbrella of his authority. And his truth. And in that, you will find peace. As we begin this journey of this week, to remember what he's done for us, to give us the opportunity to have that peace, what he did on that cross. May you just have that in the back of your mind. If I only knew, if I can stop creating the happiness that I want, if I try to stop living in my own moments and step out of that and live in him, there I find peace. Take time this week to go to him. Spend daily time with him. Seek him. Join us next week. On Thursday night, we have a special online. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube or like us on Facebook. Don't miss out our special Thursday night that we have on our our social media accounts. Friday night, join us here for our Good Friday service. And then join us back here again next week as we celebrate the victory that comes in the middle of chaos. And just realize, he is peace. Seek him today. Seek him this week. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you because of how good you are. And Father God, I know for me and probably for so many of us, we try to create our own peace by creating our own bubbles of reality. Just if we can just get into our happy place, then maybe everything will be okay. But Lord God, your truth always shines through. 
Lord, one day conflict is on the horizon. And Lord, in that moment, may we be in your protection, in your arms. And Lord God, may we experience your peace. God is towards your heart this week, Father God. And guide our steps. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.